Hi, everybody, and welcome to the support stream. I'm Alexander Pascal. With me today is Zach Parrish, hey. our developer relations technical artist. And uh, we'll be talking about profiler, rendering, and all the stuff that comes with it. And hopefully now all of the sound stuff is going OK. But let us know if anything starts acting funny. And Shelly's got it all under control. So, yeah, now with more sound. Right? <laughs> so uh, the goal of today's live stream is to give you kind of an update on the different profiling tools that are available in Unreal Engine 4 and how you can use them to track down problems with rendering. Now, to make it easier for folks to follow along, we're going to be using projects that are already freely available on the Learn tab. And this comes with a bit of a trade-off, because most of that stuff has already been optimized. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're not going to see any really glaring problems today, which is OK. The goal is really more to show you where these tools are, uh, the kind of data you're going to be getting out of them, and, uh, and how to use them. On your end, you know, as you're starting to profile your own projects, you may notice you know, certain glaring issues or something taking a lot more time than it should. And you'll have uh, the data you need to start drilling down into those. But overall, this is going to be a little on the uh, introductory side. When we're done, as a bonus, I'll show you how to use the uh, CPU profiler to dig a little bit into blueprints in case you uh, have blown something up in blueprints and you want to see how. So uh, jumping right in, I am uh, in the shooter game project right now. So you can see me kind of flying around in here. And what we're going to do is uh, open up uh, the, uh, basically start like a, a generic profiling run on this. If somebody said, here, uh, take a look at this and see how it's performing. You know, what are some of the immediate things that you would do? And there's some, uh, some guidelines you should always kind of have in mind. Uh, first off, when you're testing, you should always try to keep in mind uh, that every single thing you're doing on your computer has overhead. So uh, you want to try to eliminate noise uh, whenever you can. So uh, that's going to mean things like make sure that the editor is uh, set, to, uh, set to be minimized. You want to turn off real time. Uh, anything else you're doing on your computer, you'll probably want to turn it off uh, while you're profiling. Uh, also, something that I find folks do when they first get started, uh, if I jump into the game real quick, I'm going to play in standalone game, not inside play in editor, uh, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, let's also turn off real time, and we'll fire up the game and let it get going. And while that's going on, I'm going to reach over, and uh, as soon as it's done saving, because it's, it's a little modal when it's saving, uh, we'll go ahead and minimize the editor in the background. We don't need that anymore. And this will launch up uh, the standalone game. There we go. Now, uh, a lot of a lot of folks that I see when they first get started, uh, they're totally new to kind of figuring out performance and profiling. The first thing they will always do uh, is they will hit stat FPS. Now that makes a lot of sense, uh, but because you know at the end of the day, you probably want to hit a given frame rate, uh, 30 or 60 or something. But uh, frame rate alone is not enough information for you to actually do any sort of optimizing work whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if all you're doing is just using frames per second, you're probably running blind. Uh, so there's a, another command you should be using, which is stat unit. A stat unit breaks down the primary threads for your game. I'll put that against a dark background and make it a little bit easier to see. In fact, let's also uh, Alt-Enter to go full screen with this. So you see we have uh, frame, we have game, draw, and GPU. So frame is going to be your important one at the very top. That's telling you how many milliseconds are required to draw a single frame of your game. Then you have the different threads. You have the game thread. And down beneath, you have what is, being, uh, what is being done to render. That's the draw thread and the GPU thread. You can kind of think, think of it as draw being the CPU, and GPU being, of course, the GPU or your, your graphics card. Now, an interesting thing to keep in mind here is that uh, you should be looking out for which one of those two things, draw or GPU, is really your bottleneck. Because uh, in, in terms of your game thread, that's just your, your game logic. That is going to be your blueprint, your code, whatever is actually making your game into something playable. Draw and GPU are what are being used for rendering. And if one of those numbers is significantly bigger than the other, then that's your bottleneck. That's what's doing the most work. And that means that the other one, the smaller number, is actually going to have to uh, do a little bit of waiting on the other one to catch up. So uh, that's uh, important to keep in mind. Now, what are these two uh, aspects responsible for, for you know, like in terms of uh, CPU and GPU? At a super high level, 
the CPU is really responsible for preparing your scene to render. Uh, it's, it gathers all of the information, and then it pushes the actual drawing over to the GPU, and the GPU is what's responsible for getting it uh, to your screen. Now, that's again, that's super high level. I mean, a, a stage deeper, uh, the CPU is going to handle any sort of occlusion, uh, any sort of culling, uh, what's in the frustum, what should we be drawing versus what we shouldn't. Uh, the GPU is going to be handling things like your triangle counts. It's going to handle uh, the pixel shader. It's going to uh, make sure that all of your lights are drawn and being rendered and so forth. So uh, now the question then becomes, what do you do uh, with this information? But even before we go there, there's something kind of important that I want everybody to be aware of. And uh, let me make sure you can still see uh, the frames per second at the top. Notice how it feels like we're kind of clamped. We hit like 62 frames a second, which is it's kind of a particular number, isn't it? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, 60 makes sense, uh, 30 makes sense, but like, where do you get 62? Well, in Unreal, we have a non-VSync uh, frame smoothing system. And that's, it's great to have because it, it helps keep your frame rates nice and smooth, but it, it will get in your way during profiling. So we're going to kill that. Now let's just uh, hit Alt F4 and close out the game. Uh, we'll tab back over, not to the launcher. We don't really care about the launcher right now. No one wants to see my $5.01 sitting in my <laughs> pathetic account there. Yeah. Go, go spend that cheddar, man. Oh, Come on. Yeah. So uh, we're going to go over to our project settings. And this is super important. If you're following along, if you're taking notes, write this one down. Uh, it'll help you as you profile your stuff. Go under general settings. And just to keep things nice and fast, uh, in the search bar, look for smooth. And you'll see smooth frame rate. And you want to uh, turn that off. Now, currently, all of that stuff looks like it's set to read only. Let me fix that real quick. Uh, they say uh, currently not writable. That's because we've pulled this down off of Perforce. So uh, if I, let's see, I probably need to find those on my hard drive and make them uh, writable real quick. Do, 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 do. W do you know where these uh, live on this computer? I, yeah, they should be under the uh, C document uh, and then Unreal projects. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, that's where you it, pulled the, them on the Perforce? Classic location. Or uh, well, I mean, I guess I guess that's kind of classic. Or at least that's where I. Hey, think. let me slide this off oh. screen. No, those are actually in the D drive. That's that's kind of what I figured. I, yeah, was, I was figuring. I, I, I had to migrate them. I forgot. Where. I got it. It's no problem. Yeah. All right. So um, now you're you're our Perforce guy on this. You're gonna have to tell you're me where these are. Alexander. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, I also have those. Um, there, there you go. There, there you go. go. I got yeah, this. Got I got it. it. You got it now. Yep. 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 Look yep. at you following that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm, there, right? mm -hmm. uh, now, what's happened here, and this is something you may run into on your end. I can't update these project files because currently everything is set to read only. I mean, there's there's ways to work around that, but the easy way is just going to be to go ahead and make everything writable for now. So we'll let that kind of do its thing. These are the kind of things you run into on a live stream. Oh, if yeah. you've pulled this stuff off the Learn tab, actually, you shouldn't run into that. Yeah, it'll all be writable off of the Learn tab. Yeah, so just... This is just because we're all bleeding edge and stuff, and so... Now, uh, notice that now all of that stuff has gone away. These are totally writable. We can now go down to uh, our general settings, and if you search for smooth, you'll see smooth frame rate. And notice, check this out, smooth frame rate, uh, rate range, Look at that. The max is 62 frames. Ugh. So if we kill that, and this could take a second to turn off the first time, uh, go ahead and close that window. And now let's play again. While that all loads up, we'll wait until we get uh, control back, and we will minimize the editor once again. Goodbye, editor. And then here comes the game. Uh, feature request that whenever we minimize the editor, it makes a pew noise. I know, and right? You got to do that. Yeah. Well, I'll let you put that one into <laughs> uh, into the Jira list. That'll be a that'll be a four nine feature. <laughs> yeah, because there's not enough of those coming. <laughs> All right. So now uh, we can come in here and just do uh, stat unit, and there's our frames. Now let's. Also put up fr uh, frames per second so that my fragile little mind can interpret this data properly. So let's do uh, stat FPS. And now check it out. We're camped out at 200 frames per second. Now that is, uh, 
you know, off the top of your head, you're probably like, ooh, that means more frames. You're like, yeah, but the, the smooth uh, frame rate is actually there for a reason, and it's going to help in the long run. Uh, but this is going to be super useful for profiling, so make sure that you turn it on. OK, so now where do you go from here? You'll also notice that now that we've taken out that, uh, that limiter, our draw and our GPU are no longer so terribly imbalanced. Uh, also, if you're following along with Shooter Game, uh, keep in mind that uh, every five minutes, this game is going to reset. Uh, I, I think I could probably change that, but I'm not going to. So we may have to uh, run around a lot and double check things. But you can solve some of that whole thing. And this may be useful on your end as well, just by pausing the game. So I just tap the pause key on my keyboard. And notice, that's gonna, the, the draw and the GPU threads are still going to keep doing uh, exactly what they were doing. But your game thread is going to drop down to almost nothing, because you're no longer calculating any of your game logic. So just uh, stuff to be aware of. OK, so now, where to go from here? Well, at this point, you can choose to either profile on the CPU or profile on the GPU. And there is no right or wrong. As a matter of fact, I want to kind of go on record and say this really early on. There is no right or wrong path in terms of profiling and optimization unless there are glaring problems. I mean, obviously, if you've got something that's eating up uh, you know, 33% of your frame time and it's killing performance and things are dying, obviously, you want to fix those things. Once you get the obvious problems, the obvious bumps in the road kind of ironed out, at that point, it's all about balance and trade-offs. Uh, you might be at 58 frames a second, and you've got to eke it up to 60. And then you've got to start figuring out what little things can you cut that don't make a, a huge difference to your game. You're always going to be making those trade-offs. So uh, definitely be aware of that. So what we're going to do first is show off the GPU profiler. Actually, you know what? Before I do that, there's something super cool I want to show you that uh, I didn't mention. You might already know about it, or you might not. Up to this point, we've only done uh, stat unit. Watch this. You can do stat unit graph. And this is the exact same thing, but it's got a, uh, a real-time graph that shows you all of the work going on on the render threads. So uh, if I unpause and fly around, you can see those graphs going a little bit crazy. And you see there's spikes every now and then. Now, those spikes can mean all kinds of things. Uh, it, if you're running into those uh, a lot, you may want to have one of your programmers nearby because it may coincide with garbage collection. Uh, it may coincide with hitting the hard drive to pull in like a streamed resource. There's all kinds of things that can cause uh, something to jump. But if they all jump in tandem, it usually means that the game thread is causing some kind of a hitch, which the, the render threads have to wait on the game thread. They have to get their information first. So if you see that red line at the bottom make a jump, and everybody else jumps in, uh, you know, in tandem with it, then something happened at the game level that, uh, that you should probably be aware of. Now, also notice, though, that these lines are color-coded. And over on your uh, stat unit list, that became color-coded as well. So you can see like green is going to be your actual frame, uh, game is your red line, draw is blue, and GPU is yellow. And wherever the line, uh, so if you, if, I don't know it's how easy it is to see, but if you take a look at uh, the green line, it's almost right in sync with uh, the yellow line. So. Uh, whenever you see that, that means whatever's closest up to the green line is probably going to be your bottleneck in terms of, uh, of your uh, rendering. So it's either going to be the CPU or the GPU. In this case, it's our GPU, but it's by kind of a narrow margin. OK, so uh, let's take a look at the GPU profiler. And I'm going to do that from out here. Now, when to use this? Uh, it's a good idea to run around and find the uh, location where the, the uh, GPU or the CPU is getting kind of the hardest hit. Like right now, you'll notice our GPU time has climbed up to 7 point something milliseconds, which is about as high as I've seen it go. So yeah, we're sitting, we're almost hitting 8. So right here, let's uh, hit tilde and let's do profile GPU. And there's going to be a brief hitch. Because what it's doing is it's grabbing all of the data for one frame. Now, I'm going to jump back here to the game for just a, a second and hit pause so that our game doesn't go any further for now, because uh, we're down to like two minutes before the match restarts. 
Now, here is the uh, GPU visualizer window. This has just uh, provided you with a breakdown of everything that just happened, everything, uh, all the work that got passed off to the GPU on this frame. And we can go line by line and see what's taking the most amount of time. At the very top, you'll see this uh, scene bar. And you'll see it's broken up into all these different areas. And you can mouse over and see what calculations are represented by each bar of the graph. So our first and probably largest, well, easily largest section is the base pass. So if we click on that, it jumps us to the base pass in the list. We can extend that, and you can see how many milliseconds it's taking to calculate each thing. So we're doing about three uh, milliseconds on the, the base pass, which is not bad. And you can see that the largest uh, percentage of that is in static, opaque lighting with no light map. Uh, now. Let's see, uh, static, opaque, with no light map, uh, that's probably going to be unlit materials. Uh, and if I had to guess, that's very likely the sky dome uh, sitting in the background. So you know, in, in some cases like that, you'll have to kind of know your scene. But the idea here is that at a glance, you can quickly see what is costing the most and uh, where you're investing all of your GPU time. So let's uh, jump back up. You'll notice there's an up arrow here to take us all the way back up to the top level. Uh, we have our lighting composition tasks for pre-lighting. So uh, you can see we have uh, a section for post-process differ decals. They're not taking much time on this one, uh, really, if any at all. Uh, we can go over to the lighting pass. And we can see what lighting information. So look, check it out. Direct lighting is taking up 0.7 seconds, or 0.7 milliseconds, excuse me. Uh, you can see uh, what percentage of that is uh, lit versus, I'm sorry, shadow versus non-shadowed lights. So again, it just really boils down to uh, tearing into this and seeing what's eating up the most time. And actually, we can see which light specifically is eating up all that time. And it's the directional light, which is providing most of the illumination for our scene. Now, on your end, if uh, you're doing this on your own projects and maybe your lighting pass is taking multiple milliseconds or it starts to become problematic, then the idea is that in here, you'll start to see which lights are eating up the most and you can start thinking about those trade offs. Maybe in the case of your directional light, uh, you know, that's the, that could be your sunlight, it could be super important, you may not be able to afford doing without it, but what settings can you change in terms of maybe it's dynamic shadows uh, or the way it's being rendered to ease up its cost? So again, the idea here is just making you aware of where those costs are coming in. And of course, at the end, we also have post-processing, and that's eating up quite a bit of time as well. And uh, the, uh, uh, the cool thing here is that you can, again, get an idea of which aspects of post-process are hitting you the hardest. Uh, so Temporal AA has uh, it's a pretty high cost relative to this area, but really 0.16 seconds for uh, that level of anti-aliasing is really not bad. Uh, at this point, you could maybe switch over your anti-aliasing method to uh, f you know, FXAA, see mm -hmm. if that's a little better. And that's going to be really situationally dependent. Uh, you cannot always say, well, uh, if, if temporal AA is, too, is you know, not very good, you know, always switch it to FXAA, because in some cases, that's not really going to be the case. Uh, as with all things, uh, testing is going to be super important. Uh, and uh, as a note, uh, a few people in the chat have asked about these commands that um, Zach just kind of uh, used for a second there. Yeah. But actually, we do have an entire doc page uh, for called stat commands. Yep. So if you just go to the docs.unrealengine.com, uh, search stat commands, you'll find a really great list of all of the commands and uh, kind of like a short description of what they're for or what they do. So yep. definitely check it out, guys. Yep, so that, that one's super important. Make sure you check out that doc page. But as a review, the big ones that we've used that are super important, and uh, I'll go ahead and, and bring this up here. They w you can actually see them listed. So we have stat unit, stat FPS, and stat unit graph, and then profile GPU. So those are the ones we've used so far uh, that are going to be super important for what we're doing right now. And in this section, uh, the stat command section is also under the performance and profiling section. So if you just go up one, you'll start seeing a lot of the stuff we're already covering today. Yep. So definitely double check over all the documentation. Yeah, there's a ton of useful stuff in there you should definitely check out. Uh, now, let's see, along with that, there's also a lot of commands that you'll find by hitting R dot. And this is going to coincide often with what you see in your uh, GPU uh, profiler. So for example, we have things like um, mm. R dot, uh, let's see. I, just, I, I blanked out. Let me go back over to my, uh, my GPU profiler real quick. 
So let's see. Uh, if we're going under our base pass, well, let's let's maybe turn on like a ambient occlusion. We could we can start making uh, adjustments there. Uh, so let's hit go back over here. So if we uh, hit r.ao, you'll see there's a big list of the different settings for ambient occlusion. So we could uh, start adjusting various things in here. And if you don't know what any of the R commands do, so R is for rendering. So th there's really a ton of rendering uh, commands already available in here. If you don't know what they do, you can hit space. Actually, if you just uh, type in any command that you see, if you're like, ooh, what does AO list memory do? Uh, if you hit space, question mark, and make sure that you have the, the full console open. Uh, <laughs> and I would pick the one that actually doesn't have a tool tip. Ooh. So uh, let's just grab something else. So r dot vsync, for example, and then space, question mark. And there you go. So it tells you exactly uh, what this does. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious in this case. Uh, zero is going to disable vsync. Uh, one is going to enable it. But that can often coincide with things that you'll see inside your profile GPU. So uh, if you see certain aspects of the render that you want to turn on and off to test, uh, you can do that there. So at a super high level, that's kind of a rundown of the GPU profiler. I do want to mention something. And this is going to sound really vague. And I wish I could go into more details. But it's hard to go into details on this without getting uh, super deep into mm -hmm. uh, individual GPU problems. But Depending on the GPU you have, you could notice different results on your projects. And uh, it should kind of sound like it you know, goes without saying, because you're reading uh, data from the GPU itself. But uh, as a, a super high level example, uh, it, on some NVIDIA GPUs, on, on many NVIDIA GPUs, actually, mm -hmm. if you run uh, profile GPU over and over again, you'll start getting what looks like different example or different uh, results. But they'll start to kind of average out. So you may have to sample multiple times, where if you use like an AMD, you'll start getting the you know, very uh, consistent results, but there are other weaknesses in other areas. Uh, it's just uh, a, a thing with using different, uh, all the different types of GPUs out there. Uh, just keep in mind that you'll want to test often and make sure that you're taking kind of an average of the results. So Because if you take the exact same project and you profile it on different GPUs, you should expect to see slightly different results. So in the testing process, it's probably a good idea to have more than one machine to, to test it out on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, if whenever you can, I feel like this should also go without saying, but you, you know, it's always a, a good idea to mention. Be sure you test on your minimum spec. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and do that early and do that often. In fact, do that as often as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, before we move on, I did want to yeah. throw in one more note. So uh, the uh, R dot commands that you were using, those are actually also right near the um, the stack commands, so if you're looking at a performance of profiling, if you're trying to find all the different um, adjust, uh, adjustable like uh, rendering features, you can actually find adjusting engine feature levels. Uh, it's another page in the docs that will have just a great big list, tool tips, information, et cetera. So just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Yep. OK, some other things I want to mention really quick, even before we move on from here. Uh, I know we haven't really gotten to Q&A yet, but there was a question that I saw roll through where somebody was asking, uh, is there a way to know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, uh, a way to know if there is a, uh, a shader that is costing too much or what part of a shader is costing too much? Yeah, the very specific uh, yeah. material node or something. Yeah, yeah. There, there's no real easy way to do that, uh, aside from keeping track of your instruction count on materials. But it is good to be aware of uh, the shader complexity view mode, which, if you're playing the game, is F5, by the way. So you have F1 for wireframe, F2 for flat shaded, so it's no lighting, F3 for your standard lit. Uh, I think F4 is switching to something, but I don't know, if, I don't know what I've thought in my head. And F5 is shader complexity. Uh, now, what this is showing you, if I unpause and walk around, is this is going from uh, very dark green, uh, well, I'm sorry, from green all the way up to red, and then eventually to white. And some of the things that will push this to its highest levels are really, really complex shaders. And then really, really high levels of overdraw. And overdraw is definitely one of those things you really want to make sure you optimize for. Overdraw is really easy to run into when you're using a lot of translucency, obviously. Uh, so you have, if you have like you know glass that you're looking through and there's ob you know something behind the glass, that's automatic overdraw because you had to render the glass and you had to render what was behind it. 
Now, an area where that becomes significant is when you have things like uh, particle simulations, where maybe you've got you know a campfire and you've got smoke, and that smoke could be a whole lot of particle uh, uh, sprite cards all stacked on top of each other. You're really going to want to pay attention to how much cost that overdraw is uh, is incurring. Basically, it boils down to keep your particle systems as minimal as you can get away with at all times. OK, so back over to the editor. So there's kind of a, a quick introduction to the GPU profiler, what it is, where to find it, the general types of data you're going to get out of it. Now we want to look at the CPU profiler. Now The CPU profiler is in an entirely different location. It does kind of the same job in that it's going to break down what's happening over a given period of time, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a single frame. Also, like the GPU profiler, the CPU profiler is not real time. Uh, so it, you remember earlier, our GPU profiler had to take a snapshot, mm -hmm. and it worked from that one frame snapshot. With the CPU profiler, on the other hand, we have to tell it to record the data, and then we have to open up that data in our project. So what I'm going to do is go back into our game, and we'll get this fired up, let it do its thing, do the loading dance. Mm, 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 mm. That's a terrible dance, by the way. It's pretty standard here, the loading dance. Is that really the standard loading dance? Why? Yeah, yeah, that's what oh. we do. Just yeah, like, it's it's yeah. mostly shoulders, Come right? On, it's, it's all the shoulders? Loading dance. All right. Yeah. Happens Whatever. all the time. Whatever. <laughs> that's why we work here. All right, so uh, loading screens, it's amazing. Look at the loading screen. Oh, look at all those particles. Look at the logo. So okay, pretty. awesome. So we're here, and the game's starting, and I'm going to wait until we can actually play, which is apparently in about, you know, seven seconds. That's cool. We can just chill. Seven seconds. you got to let all the players load into the lobby and, you know, swear at each other's moms. Three, two, one, and there we're here. Go. Hurrah. Okay, cool. Charge around. So uh, if we want to use the CPU profiler, and we could do this. We could go um, stat unit once again so that we can see uh, what's going on. So the, the draw listing you see there is basically what the CPU is doing. Now, to make this work, let me show you where the tool lives, and then I'll show you how to get data to it. So let me, go to, let me pause the game. Let's uh, tab back over to the editor real quick. The tool we're going to use is located under Window, and you'll go down to Developer Tools, and you'll go down to the Session Front End. So we'll click on that, and that's going to open up the Session Front End. Now, the session front end has a whole bunch of stuff in it that we're not going to use right now. It's got automation tests. It's got the entire console stuff. All we care about is the profiler. And if you've never seen this before, it may come across as a bit challenging. It also may come across as super unintuitive because there's no real obvious way to know how to get data into this. Can you tell it was made by a programmer? I could tell it was made by a programmer. I could totally tell it was made by a programmer, but it is super cool, super useful, and super handy as soon as you know this one thing. And that one thing is that you have to record the data to send in. It's kind of like, kind of like a football game. Uh, and I know that people all over the world, do, do you mean football or do you mean soccer? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Some sport where somebody is sitting there with a camera recording it, and then the team all goes back to the locker room and they watch the tape to figure out what went wrong and who could have played better. It's the exact same thing. We just need to make a quick recording to figure out what happens next. So let me, uh, actually, let me go back over to the editor, and for safety's sake, let's minimize the editor, get that uh, as far out of the calculation as we can. We'll unpause the game, and I'm going to use a very important command. Make sure you're taking notes here. This is stat start file, right? And I'll bring that to the middle of the screen so everybody can see it. Then we press Enter, and you get a, a little message that says, we are profiling with AI logging on, uh, run around, shoot things. If you're already in an area of your game where you saw the draw uh, thread get kind of high, I mean, this is a good time to do that. And we'll hit it again. We'll do stat, now, stop file. Now, I'm going to bring up the console just so you can see those again. That's stat start file and stat stop file. What we just did is we hit record on a little internal camera that was grabbing all of the function calls, everything that our game was doing, and recording that all to a little, a little file on our hard drive. And then as soon as we hit stop, it stopped recording. Now that we've done that, we can tab back over to the editor. And we can go back over to the session front end jump back over to the profiler. Now, click the load button. In fact, let's make this nice and full screen. So we'll click the load button, and it'll take you right where you want to go. 
right under uh, Unreal Stats, there's the level that we have open, and you, you could potentially, if you're doing a lot of profiling, you'll get a stack of these. There will be a whole lot of different files you've created. Just keep track of the most recent one. Uh, and usually when I'm doing this, I just sort it by date modified. So uh, the, the latest one is always at the top. Double click this, and it put focus back on the game, which is fine. Let's use that as an opportunity to pause the game, and we'll tab back over to the editor. And here's the session front end, and it's loading. And it may take a moment to load because it's a lot of data that it just pulled in. Doobie doobie doo. This is loading dance time. Oh. Just about. All right, oh, cool. Done. So we're here. We've got it. Now, uh, there's some stuff in the window that we don't need for this job. Like, we're not worried about multiple sessions because this is static at this point. We're just reviewing stuff that's already here. So I'm actually going to take this part of the window and kill it off because we don't need it. Uh, we have a bar at the top that allows us to kind of see what the rendering thread and the game thread were doing kind of at a glance. And then we can zoom in, and there's a, a little, I don't know how well it's actually showing up in the video, but you can see we actually have a little line graph which is showing any spikes, peaks, valleys and important stuff all along the way. Now, you can click on any given area and see what was happening at that one specific frame, or you can drag a bar across and you can take an average and grab everything that was happening all at that, uh, along that way. So uh, just keep in mind that navigating this can be uh, a little bit fun. You will probably end up doing a lot of adjusting to your window size. Uh, so note that you can do this, like that uh, line graph, we can kind of crush that down if we've already found the area that we care the most about. This is going to list off, this uh, large area in the middle is going to list off all of the uh, function calls that have taken place. We don't really need that at the moment very much, so we're going to bring this up. And here is a list of everything that happened during this window of time that we selected. Now, in this case, at the moment, all we care about is the render thread, and there it is. So we can expand that, and there's all this stuff that goes into the render thread. Now, in terms of performance, in terms of stuff that we can control, most of uh, what we care about is right here in fdraw scene command. So we can expand that, find the render view family, and there's some stuff that we've already seen in the GPU. We have the base pass drawing. So this is the CPU side of the base pass. There's our static drawing list. So you can see, it took us 1.3 milliseconds to get all of our static objects. And then it took us 0.75 milliseconds to get all of our dynamic objects. And on your end, if you're doing this to, uh, you know, on your own objects, maybe you've got a ton of dynamic objects, and you see that really take a, a huge spike. At that point, you might want to already start thinking, ooh, do I have too many dynamic things in my scene? Now, I mean, as you move down through, really all you're looking for here are areas where uh, you see uh, large jumps in, uh, in time. Now, we're probably not going to see anything really big jump out at us because a lot of this content has already been uh, optimized. We, uh, we hammer, especially on shooter game, we hammer on this one a lot. So uh, if we jump under F deferred shading scene render, you'll see there's lighting here. Now, notice on each one of these entries, there's a little blue tag you can mouse over that and get some uh, more detailed information without having to expand it. Uh, one of the more important things you'll notice in here, and it's, uh, I, I don't think I can move the mouse to it, uh, but in the second column, one up from the bottom, uh, there's average number of calls per frame. Remember that I pointed that out to you. Uh, that will come in handy a little bit later, especially when you're uh, debugging things like blueprints. Mm -hmm. So you can get an idea of how many times a function is called on any given frame. Oh, I see. So here we have uh, render lights and shadows, and this is where it starts to get kind of cool. We can step down into, uh, well, actually, right off the bat, we can see our directional light component. And if we expand that out, there is a little tiny window here so we can see. Here's exactly which light we're calculating. It's directional light 1, and its light component is eating up 0.41 milliseconds. Now, that's actually pretty good. That, that's not uh, problematic in any way. Again, we're not really working with problematic content here. But it's good for you to know how to dive into these things so that when you see something taking up a lot of time, you can uh, see how to identify where it is and how to get to it in your scene. So you can see, uh, in terms of this light, we have 
exactly what its cost is for uh, shadow projections, which is you know 0.3 milliseconds, and its direct lighting cost as well, which is actually quite minimal. Mm. And the reason that's important is that you can do this for each and every individual light. So if you see uh, that you've got maybe a lot of dynamic or even uh, maybe something like stationary lights in your scene that you've put up because they look really good and they're casting shadows, you know, you can start to see those numbers pile up in here and start thinking, ooh, can I gain a few milliseconds back if those were maybe casting static shadows so we didn't have to keep paying for them all the time? Uh, is it really worth it to have them casting shadows? You can start making those trade-offs in a much more intelligent manner. So that is... Uh, at a kind of a, a high level, that is the basics of the CPU profiler. Again, the big takeaway here is that you're going to need to record the data to send into it. You're going to be doing that with stat start file and stat stop file. And once you have that data, what you're really looking for is just keeping an eye on where you're incurring the most cost in terms of your render thread. And you can just step down into each one, and it'll eventually get you to the actor that is costing the most. So are there any questions about this aspect of things before we go on? Now, I've got a few questions already that we can kind of jump into. Well, yeah, we don't have a whole lot of time today, but we do have a few of these questions that we can go ahead and start going into this portion of them. Um, let's see here. Uh, and, and uh, you know, feel free to say, like, we'll have to talk to a developer on some sure, of these. Sure, sure. Um, which costs more? And a lot of things did come down to what costs more. Uh, they always will. Yeah. Um, having the, what's going to irritate oh, yeah. people, I'll just get it out of, the, out of the gate now. When you say what costs more, A or B, in many cases the answer is going to be some derivative of it depends. Yeah. Yeah. But go ahead. Um, it, it, which would cost more? Having many more very low poly vegetation instances or uh, just a few denser meshes, I guess clusters that are all one big mesh? I, well, th uh, the answer really is it depends, but generally speaking, it is less expensive to have uh, clusters with a higher poly count. Uh, now, this is especially true on mobile, where for the most part, you're bottlenecked by draw calls. Draw calls are super important on mobile, and you want to keep mm -hmm. those down to a minimum. And each individual object that you have to draw is a separate draw call. Now, that gets exponentially uh, worse if you have uh, multiple materials on different faces. So like if I have a single object with three materials on it, then that's three draw calls to draw that one thing. Then on top of that, if I have uh, like three different UV panels, then there's like that starts to, to separate vertices and, and costs start climbing up really, really fast. Yeah. Generally, at the super high level, uh, it's better to cluster things. And there's evidence of that already in the editor, where if you use our foliage tool, it's automatically mm -hmm. clustering for you. Yeah, it automatically takes all those instances and makes them into one big, like, uh, one big yep, object. Yeah, within a given <coughs> radius to, mm -hmm. to kind of optimize. And that's, that's your answer right there. So yeah, generally speaking, you, uh, the, the clusters will be much more efficient. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, how about how about this one just for like the kind of general tips and tricks? Uh, is there any obvious rules to optimizing games that all veterans know and rookies have to know and just generally don't? Yeah, uh, and I've, these are some ones that uh, I think people they they don't struggle with. It's just you don't know what you don't know, which is yeah. perfectly understandable. Uh, the so try to keep dynamic lights to uh, to a minimum, especially shadow casters. Mm. And that sounds painfully obvious, but it's not always. Especially when people you know get into an engine that obviously does beautiful things, like you know, Unreal Engine Four. Like you see, like our kite demo, which is mind-blowingly pretty. So you start thinking, cool, I can make my project. I can just add all the pretty ever. And you can. You just have to remember that comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, watch out for dynamic lights. Uh, their directional lighting costs can start to stack up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to watch shadow casters. Uh, if you're not casting shadows, watch your light radius. You want to keep your uh, keep your dynamic light radius as small as you can, and keep that light contained so it's not affecting as many objects, or, or at least is, is, uh, keep it affecting as few as it possibly can. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was prepping for uh, this project, one of the projects that I was uh, just tinkering around with was our platformer game project, which you can get on the Learn tab. Mm -hmm. And there is a single light. I'll let you guys dig it up. I'm just going to mention that it's there. And, and depending on when you're watching this, if you're watching like a YouTube re-record of it, we might have fixed it. I'm just going to mention this. You can find, using the stuff I've shown you so far, there is one light that is set to stationary that should have been set to static and should have been baked, but isn't. 
mm -hmm. and you're actually eating a pretty significant cost for it. And you can actually look in the profiler and see that one. You can is find like, it. It's just eating it a little bit You can bit find more. It. it. It's one light, and it's set to stationary, and it's got a really, really long radius. So if you just go turn it off, it, and all it's doing, it's, it's actually kind of like a beautifying light. Mm -hmm. It's adding a little bit of illumination and a little bit of shading to a given area. But if you either just kill it or set it to static and rebuild, which I was lazy and didn't want to spend the time, so I just turned it off, you actually get a few milliseconds back. So there is uh, some optimization to be had right there. And it's really just in dynamic lighting. So that's a huge one. Uh, another one is uh, going to be uh, overdraw, as we've kind of already mentioned. Make sure you keep uh, the number of polygons rendering on top of each other, uh, especially with translucency, to a minimum. Uh, depending on your platform, that becomes more or less of a challenge. For example, uh, for uh, mobile, you are not going to be using masked materials very much. You're going to be using uh, translucent. Uh, but on PC, you very well could be going the other way. So uh, again, it comes out to testing on your target platform. Uh, some other obvious ones are you know try to keep the instruction count on your shaders as low as you can. Uh, some r areas where your shaders can get really expensive really quickly if you're not paying attention are things like um, world position offset. Uh, it's I've I've known a few folks who really like using world position offset to do uh, tweaks or adjustment to shapes. Be like, oh, I need this object to be a little bit bigger. I know I'll just make the shader puff it up a little bit, uh, or, or in certain ways. I've I've seen folks do that, and that's very expensive. Mm. Uh, so anything you can do. Uh, that's pre-calculated is often going to be uh, faster in the long run. Or uh, another common one is using tessellation to smooth out a mesh uh, that came in, and maybe it's a little uh, too chunky, and you want to you know, make it a little smoother. You can use tessellation to do that, but that's very expensive, and it's probably better for you to just do that in Maya and mm -hmm. bring in the smooth version. Um, all right. Uh, we've definitely got a, a few more general this and that kind of questions about it, but um, let's let's keep just you want, throw if, them you, out. if you feel comfortable with it. Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's just go. Okay. So um, uh, one question here is uh, in the Unreal stats, the memory one is quite amazing, but how do you know if any line is too high? You don't. Uh, that that one is super super dependent on uh, on your given platform, right? So this is again, it's a it's, it depends. Yeah, uh, that's that's. I mean, too high is uh, it's it's actually starting to hit performance. Mm. Uh, so that's uh, that's like you're starting to uh, feel it in terms of frame rate. I mean, y then it, it comes down to identifying where the problems are. Is it file input and output? Is it memory bandwidth? Um, knowing what is too high. Because uh, cause in your case, what you're saying is, uh, like, at what point am I using too much memory? Be like, well, what device are you on? Oh, uh, yeah. It's, are it's about that target device, too. Yeah, are That's you, really where that are you on down some, to. Yeah, are you on, you on something that has 256 megs of memory or something that has 16 gigs of memory or, or like, 4 gigs available? Or, you know, does it have a, a GPU with video memory or not? So that's super, super dependent. And uh, in many cases... What you really want is to just uh, at least start off by keeping an eye on how many milliseconds it's taking to get anything done, and don't worry about the other aspects of it, yeah. at, le at least not out of the gate. Now, if you, if you get to that point where it's like, well, I've got this thing, and it's taking a whole lot of time to process this one thing, and I can't seem to change the content, then you might want to dive a little deeper. But that's a little outside the scope of where we're going today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. In, uh, in this process, do you personally have any kind of checklist that you have in your mind of, I'm going to make a scene tutorial, et cetera, where's the first thing I go once I'm done to make sure that I didn't, you know, kill anything? Uh, uh, I mean, some of it we kind of already covered. Uh, make sure that you're testing on the platform that you intend to be on mm -hmm. uh, so that you know what the obvious things are. I mean, I do a lot of stuff on, uh, on mobile, uh, Android and iOS. And if I lose track and I'm just you know hammering, making like the coolest thing ever, and I'm really proud of it, and I spend a couple of days working on it, and I'll take it over to Android, and, and nothing, nothing works, uh, mm -hmm. because I should have tested a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know that's that's kind of the the big thing is kind of test along the way. Yeah, test uh, early and often. Test early, test often. You can't really do it too much. Um, if you can get help doing that, then do that. Test on as many devices as you uh, you think is feasible. In terms of an overall checklist, I mean, uh, a lot of it's the stuff that we've kind of done here. So you load up your game. Uh, get rid of all of the static generating things you can. Get rid of the noise. So kill off the editor, uh, or you know, or get it you know minimized and out of the way so you're not calculating it. Uh, get rid of anything else that may be eating up resources on your computer. Uh, start with stat unit and stat FPS so you can see which frame count is. 
Uh, make sure that you turn off frame smoothing, as we've already mentioned. Uh, use the stat unit to see where the cost of each frame is really going. And if the, uh, if the draw number is higher, then jump right to the CPU profiler and see where all that's going. If the GPU profiler number, or if the GPU thread is higher, then go into the GPU profiler and see where all that cost is going. And I think from there, even just from, from those few things that we've already covered, you'll be able to find any glaring problems in your content that you're going to need to tackle. All right. Uh, and uh, a question that kind of popped up because of that, uh, is there a special way of prof that you would profile mobile versus PC, v besides the you're kind of aiming at a sort of lower end uh, machine? Uh, yeah, there, there are some things to definitely keep in mind. Um, actually, if I jump back over to the editor, there's, there's actually a stat command that I'm I I'm sure I didn't actually cover here. Let's see. Let's do um, sat, stat scene rendering. So scene rendering is actually a really good one as well. Uh, so this is going to show you a lot of the stuff that's already in the the uh, uh, the GPU renderer. Um, so usually, if I'm uh, profiling for uh, just jumping back, sorry, I just want to make sure I mention that one. Uh, if I'm profiling uh, for mobile, the big thing I want to kind of keep in mind is the the number of draw calls. And there are several different uh, stat commands. If you check out that stat uh, commands page in Docs, mm -hmm. there are different ways you can you can bring that up and be aware of how many draw calls you have. Uh, of course, that universe is changing very quickly uh, with APIs like Metal on iOS and uh, and and uh, other different approaches to rendering. The number of draw calls is always going to be important, but it's becoming less important because we're we're finding ways to allow you to draw more things to the scene. But I mean, I always keep an eye on uh, on things like draw calls. Uh, lighting is a whole lot more expensive on mobile, mm -hmm. so I try to get away with as little as possible, if any. Um, if you're doing something on mobile, so okay, this is something that I don't always mention to folks. Uh, I especially don't mention it to super beginners who are just touching the engine for the first time because I feel like it can send confusing messages. But uh, what you can do if you go under your project settings and you go under uh, rendering. Uh, this is something that you may or may not ever want to do, but you can do it. Hang on, let me let me dig it up. I'm terrible at searching for this thing. Uh, so I, I'm missing it right now. So there is a way to turn off the G buffer if you want, and if you kill it, I, I could have sworn it was search for a G buffer, but they might have changed it recently. Um, I'll look back up and I'll, I'll make a, a post about it later. But you can uh, turn off uh, the G buffer, at which point you're not using any lighting whatsoever. Mm. So all of your materials need to be unlit at that point. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing like a stylized game where you don't really care about lighting and everything can be emissive, uh, you can do like you know vector operations. If you're unfamiliar, you could do like um, take in a vector and then do the dot product between that vector and the camera, and then that vector becomes a simu uh, simulation you can use to create light. There's a good example of this in the uh, stylized uh, example that we have already in the Learn tab. That's how mm. we do uh, cell shading. Mm. If you want a, a, re a ready example, open that up and take a look at the clouds, because mm. the clouds actually have a banded tune shader that's using that exact same, same system. So using tricks like that, though, you can make things appear to be lit entirely using the shader, and then completely turn off the G buffer and just render everything out flat, hmm. uh, which is uh, which it can be super useful for mobile, especially, because uh, the nature of uh, the G buffer is you have all these different textures that had to be pumped into and out of memory quite a bit, and by turning off the G buffer, you're not relying on those anymore, and your performance can really can jump up. But again, that's only if if you can afford it, right? If mm -hmm. you're counting on the G buffer, if you need things like you know PBR rendering, which completely goes away otherwise, uh, then you know you have to keep it for that sort of thing. If you're doing like a very cartoony game or something that looks very flat, I know a lot of uh, paper 2D things that aren't using lighting, mm -hmm. you may not need the G buffer at all. You can just totally turn it off. Uh, another one is uh, post processing. Mm -hmm. So post processing comes in uh, kind of at, at a bit of a fixed cost, but the more changes and things you, you make, you can actually make post processing very expensive. Uh, so watch out for that as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna. I think we should take this one question as the uh, last for today. Um, okay. Uh, am I working on any more tutorial series? Um, yes, I am. Uh, yeah. There, I have a tutorial uh, series that is in progress right now. It had to be pushed back until we launch four eight. 
And before anybody asks, I don't know if I'm the guy who can say when that's coming. It, sh it should be like. Uh, actually, I was going to probably say something at the end of the stream that, you know, I actually. The reason that I got to get moving, I got to start pushing yeah. stuff. So we're, we're yeah. all running around and putting stuff in places and trying to make that thing happen. So it's, so it's yeah, going it's, down for real. Yeah, so 4 8 is very, 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 very nearly upon us. Uh, and I didn't want to go through. Uh, the this next tutorial set with a preview build, not because anything wouldn't work, but just because I felt like it was bad pra uh, bad practice. Because mm -hmm. if something got a little borked in the meantime, or if somebody ran into a real problem, I just don't want to deal with the PR of hey, well this didn't work on, on a preview build because the preview build is really exactly that. Mm -hmm. It's a preview. You shouldn't be doing hardcore development on it. So I didn't want to encourage that by doing a training video set using a preview build. So as soon as 4.8 comes out, I got a, a new series coming out over uh, building a, a game from scratch in Blueprint, uh, starting from some FBX files, and it really tears into uh, the hows and the whys of different approaches, uh, a lot of reusing code in Blueprint. So, or, sorry, I, I say code when I mean Blueprint. So a lot of uh, reusing scripts mm -hmm. by way of child blueprints and things like that. I think it's going to be really useful to some folks. Oh, yeah, they're going to definitely want to see that about child blueprints. Now, before we jump out, I do want to show off one thing, a little bonus that I said I would do. It won't take long. Um, so a lot of folks ask me, because uh, I just mentioned Blueprint, they're like, well, how do you know if your uh, Blueprints are being efficient or if they're, they're costing too much? You can actually uh, query a fairly large chunk of that data uh, using the same tools that we've already looked at. You're, mm -hmm. you're snickering. What's up? It's, it's Aller's fault. It's all awesome Aller's fault. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Gotcha. Gotcha. What's, what's happening? We, we're loading anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, loading dance time? Yeah, oh, well, yeah. kind of. So real quick, uh, I'm going to go over to, let, let's open a level, and let's do um, the Blueprints Advanced Map. Now, the reason I'm picking on this one specifically is just because you probably already have it on your hard drive. So if you want to follow along or try this at home, you can do it. If you don't have this on your hard drive already, you should get it on your hard drive already. Uh, cool. Compiling shaders is fine. So I'm going to come over here to this end of the map. Uh, let's do the same thing we've done up to this point. So. Let's go to edit. Let's go to our uh, project settings uh, under general. Let's look for our frame smoothing. Yeah, we're going to turn that off for now. Oh, yeah. we y OK. Bear with me. I'm going to skip on turning off the frame smoothing for now just because I would have to go dig it back up. Uh, this is just a, a quick bonus to show you guys something very, very cool. So instead of worrying about frame smoothing, Let's just go ahead and play this in the standalone game. I recommend you do that, but now for, for time's sake, we're going to skip it. So we'll do the standalone game, and we will uh, minimize the game in the background. And do, 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 do. And we're loading in. It's fun. OK, cool. And we'll run down here. Yes, the light needs to be rebuilt. We don't care. OK, now check this out. Let's uh, do stat unit. Cool, there's all of our stuff. Now, if you're profiling blueprints, that's all going to be stuff on the game thread. So right now, our game thread is really minimal. We're just doing like a couple of little fun things with blueprint, right? But we want to know what the costs are or how to identify them. So let's do exactly what we did before. We'll do stat start file, and that's going to start recording. And now let's just we can watch our little bouncy guy do his thing. We can come over here to our little uh, uh, the spotlight that follows you and let it do its thing. We'll back away, and then we'll do stat stop file cool so we've recorded a chunk of time now we can close out of this let's go back over to the editor and let's open up the session front end just like we did before and we'll go straight over to the profiler let's make this nice and big and we'll load up our data give this a moment to load dooby 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 doo Almost there. OK, awesome. And it's it's coming in. Go, 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 go. I have faith. You can do it. Almost. Almost. There it there is. You go. OK, awesome. So uh, again, there's some stuff we don't need in terms of screen space if we're just using the profiler. So I'm going to kill the session browser. Uh, in this case, I don't really care much about the graph. Uh, what I really care about is this area down here. And we're going to go right over to the game thread. And look, the, the biggest thing by far, basically the only thing, is frame time. So we expand that. And then we see the uh, 
there's the engine loop, which is basically the engine doing its thing, and there is our game engine tick. So if we jump down inside game engine tick, we see the world tick time, and then underneath that is just tick time, and then underneath that is, let's see, we've got our tisk, uh, uh, tick group, game task graph tasks. I love trying to say that out loud. And then there's our F tick function call task, and as we keep drilling down, check it out. There are all of our blueprints. There's our blueprint spotlight follow. There's our timeline component. And if it's hard to see the names, if you stretch that out, that's our ball bounce right there. So there's our two blueprints. Now, if we go into our spotlight, because actually he's costing, uh, I mean, not much in the grand scheme of things, but we can see that he, he's incurring a bit of a cost. We can expand that. And inside blueprint time, we can step down inside. And if you go far enough, Check it out. You can see each and every individual node in the blueprint and see what it's costing. So if you're wondering, like, well, how do I know, you know whether something I'm doing in blueprint is costing too much? I mean, you'll only know that if your game thread starts to get really, really dense. But mm -hmm. if you step down, and again, this started at frame time, down under game engine tick, world tick time, and then you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs all the way down until you eventually see your blueprint and then step down further and further into your blueprint, and you'll find each individual node. And if you start doing something really, really crazy in blueprint, this is where you can identify what parts of your graph are eating up the most time. Oh, wow. Now, a little thing that I actually found out about on the way to this room to give this live stream. So this is more than hot off the presses. This uh, information, so this data, is actually going to be integrated into the blueprint editor to allow you to profile this kind of stuff right inside the editor, even do things like uh, set up flags where if tick is taking more than X amount of time, you can throw out an execution error and halt execution. Uh, now, that the work on that is starting now for 4.9, probably, and like it, he was wincing when he told me, he's like, probably won't be in until 4.10. It's still a pretty cool tool, though. Yeah. That's going to be really, really helpful. Yeah, definitely. It's So the, the goal, and it, I, I the, think it was Nick Whiting. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and the, the, the man. Cl the clean way to put what he said is we're, we're, we're trying to make it stupid proof. So it would be a lot harder to do stupid things with Blueprint. So uh, that's totally off the beaten path of optimizing for rendering, but it was just a quick added bonus I wanted to mention. I think that's pretty much all the time we, uh, yep. we have today. Yep, I got to go do some things, and you do too. Yep. But, you know, you guys hold tight, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. But, uh, yeah, see you then. See you guys. Later.